Hello, I'm Steve. I've been running Wine and Dine since 1998 and they've been very successful. They're very small events with up to 25 people. We supply a meal, wine, um, a celebrity signing and photograph session and we also have an interview. This is the Wine and Dine event with Tom Baker. We hope you enjoy it and it is going to be absolutely hilarious. Brought up in Liverpool, I was um, quite a poor area of Liverpool. Yes, but I didn't know it was poor. It was at only the time. Was, no, I didn't know. I thought it was great at the time, but I didn't know it was poor. You know, because but although we were glad to be poor, because as you know, when you're religious, which we were madly religious, the wonderful confidence trick about religion is you're supposed to be glad to be poor. That explains that religion is run on paradoxes. Otherwise, people to explain to the poor how lucky they are. Like, blessed are the poor. What a load of old bollocks, then. <laughs> <laughs> blessed are the poor, for they shall see God. Well, I mean, you know, even Geoffrey Archer wouldn't try one. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> he is utterly shameless. Uh, and the other one is, um, the other popular scam is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Mark Twain remarked sarcastically, it'd be very interesting to see how long they hold on to it. <laughs> <laughs> so religion is sustained on all these amazing things, on ama absolutely amazing things that people, curiously, in the area of spirituality are able to absorb. I mean, you know, the bigger the lie, the bigger the impossible improbability, the more willingly we accept this, which is one of the reasons why Doctor Who was very successful, but you can ask me about that later. But I mean, you know, we, camels going through eyes of needles. I mean, that's a very nice one, isn't it? You know? <laughs> God going down to Nazareth to knock up a little Jewish virgin to start the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can understand a lot of that going on in Crawley and Liverpool. <laughs> but the God, not only did he go down to Nazareth to knock up, he, well, he didn't go down himself, because, you know, God is three. <laughs> that's another thing. <laughs> uh, he sent the Holy Ghost down to do it. <laughs> Which, you know, so how do ghosts knock up virgins? And, uh, <laughs> but we all believe all that nice things, you know, and, uh, and that heaven and hell. And uh, So we were felt privileged to be poor, which was a mark of the triumph of the, of the idiocy of our... Uh, no wonder we were no flops at school. You know, we could swallow any old guff. <laughs> and, of course, you understand that at that time, when I was young, I was in... It was the war, so it was a wonderful time for me. Um, with the, uh, you know, with being bombed, because I can't tell you how I liked that. It was simply <laughs> wonderful. And it was great, you see, because uh, when it was just adventure, you didn't go to school, you sat up all night in air raid shelters and listened to ladies telling dodgy stories and singing Faith of Our Fathers. And then out in the street, you know, there were women bursting into flames all over the place. <laughs> old women, I mean, you know, because they're they burst into flames because they're like kindling wood old birds, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> that's why you've got to be very tactful with an old lover. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why old, old women who advertise for young shags always prefer non-smokers. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they're bursting into bloody flames. <laughs> you have so a strict yeah. Catholic upbringing. Very Your mother was a devout Catholic. She was. Um, you were a monk for about six years, weren't you? Wow, that's a big jump. You've just <laughs> got, hey. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, that's right, I was, yeah. But, I mean, that's a jump. Um, so when you were 15? Yeah, but when I was a boy, I mean, the, two, the big event was the war and, uh, and the bombing and the cutting off at school. And then, the, um, and then came, you know, the church as I grew older and then becoming a professional liar and then going to... <laughs> kind of self-loading <coughs> glasses. <laughs> <laughs> because you were an altar, altar boy when you were I was indeed an altar boy, yes. And so religion uh, is a very important part of your early life, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Well, it's an important part of anybody's early life if they, if they were caught up in the passion of it. If you're able to break free of it later, it can become a great subject of comedy. Uh, if you don't break from, from it, of course, it becomes a great subject of tragedy uh, because nothing can be so wicked and willful as, you know, the whole basis of Christianity, <coughs> I hope there's a vicar here, um, <laughs> is, is based on the imperfectibility of, our, of people. It's based on original sin. 
which is that we are born damaged, that we have an internal desire to, you know, towards wickedness. Uh, this, of course, suits the whole thing. That's a setup. And then the next stage is, but if you do this, you can be restored. And what happens is to destroy the wickedness of being born imperfect. That is achieved by the sacrament of baptism, and then reinforced later on by the sacrament of, uh, you know, confession, of con confirmation, then of marriage. So they hold on to you all the time until the very last sacrament of all. This is a brilliant fucking scam, this, <laughs> which is extreme unction, you know, <laughs> at the very end. I mean, it's absolutely amazing thing. And I really must write some children's stories about this. <laughs> <laughs> so that was all. That was all part of life. So I got going as an actor uh, in all this drama. You know, you you know, uh, what's his name? You know that poem of that very uh, sad poem of Philip Larkin. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. Yeah. The they don't mean to, but they do. They add an, They give you all the faults they had and add another few just <laughs> for you. <laughs> but then they were fucked up in their turn by men silly old fools in... Men in old style hats and coats. Funny old hats and coats, who half, half the time, time are loving kind. Sopping time. stern, half at one another's throats. Yeah. Man hands on misery to man. He said, tell me, he's a brilliant poet, but he's so miserable at the end. He, <laughs> says, he says, uh, man hangs on misery to man. It deepens like an ocean shelf. Get out as quickly as you can, and don't have any kids yourself. But we don't need bloody Philip Larkin. <laughs> you know, to give us a despair, but his, his acuity is, is extraordinarily penetrating. Now, Alan Bennett said in his incomparable wry way, he said, quoting and then parodying Larkin, they fuck you up, your mum and dad, and if you want to become a writer, that can come in very handy. <laughs> 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 because, you know, if they haven't fucked you up and you want to write novels or something, you haven't got much to be going on with, really, have you? Uh, so, if you have, so that's why, in a, in a bizarre way, and in a rather sad way, having, you know, this confession to being abused as a child while having had a hard time is to gain kind of street cred. That is why middle class girls, not that I know much about them, but some of them know something about me, is that middle class girls affect common accents. The middle classes in their confusion and uh, their, their shame about being successful and, you know, having clean knickers and things like that. So they want to become honorary proletarians and so they adopt daft accents. So if, you know, when I was introduced to someone from a family, say, you might say, they say, this is Tom Baker, he comes from Liverpool. They say, hello there, are you all right, whack? <laughs> what are you saying there? Uh, <laughs> or, you know, I, <laughs> the Duchess of uh, York was always doing naff things like that. That's interesting, yes, it, uh, people do do that. Otherwise. Well, I mean, uh, well, otherwise, the, I mean, the middle classes, the other middle classes following football, is they become honorary proles every Saturday, don't they? <laughs> and they don't have the language, because they, they've got to reach for it. It's like Tony Benn when he calls people mate. You know, he's still vice, can't stand, he can't say mate credibly, it doesn't sound right. And so when some middle class fellow, instead he can't say, you're a wanker to the ref, he says something really naff, like, you know, the ref's an autoeroticist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to it, they say, well, this is what did you say? You know, I said he was an autoerotic. Fucking autoerotic. He's a bleeding wanker. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, all this kind of it. So, coming from certain places is, it can be lucky, can't it? Because Liverpool, with its, its heroic football team, her heroism as a port, its linguistic ingenuity, which came from the fact that it was a, a great international seaport. Uh, and lots of families, therefore, had men who were touched by, you know, distant mm. parts. I don't know how deeply they went in. I used to, when I was briefly in the Merchant Navy, I used to talk to a chap <coughs> called Taffy Hole, a prodigious gin drinker, and he had been everywhere, but he'd say to him, he'd say, Taffy, <coughs> have you ever been to Valparaiso? That's a nice name, isn't it? Valparaiso. Fucking hell, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Eduardo's bar. There's a girl there with Oh, wow. <laughs> so great, yeah. What about Montreal? Montreal? Joe Beefs. Oh, he says, a girl called Doreen there with an arse like the back of a... <laughs> <laughs> These guys have been everywhere in bars, you know. They might as well have stayed in Liverpool, really. <laughs> but they did pick up odd expressions, odd words crept <clears throat> back in. Those uh, phrases came back. They brought records back. The Liverpool Yanks, they were called, especially the, the catering uh, on the big liners, not the very biggest liners, because they all sail out of Southampton. And so Liverpool was an interesting place to be born in. And the race, racial strife there <coughs> between the Irish and uh, the Irish Protestants, Irish Roman Catholics, 
uh, our hatred of the Jews because, you know, religion, uh, the Christians believe that the Jews are responsible for the death of Christ, which in a kind of daft way, I suppose, uh, is, at the, is at the basis of anti-Semitism. We were brought up, we, uh, at six we knew things like, um, well, we knew the quote, we hated Jews because they chose Barabbas rather than Christ, as is in the Gospels. And they said, they cried out, didn't they, when Pilate really tried to uh, do it for Jesus. Uh, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And it, uh, how, how obscene that children of six or seven were, you know, were, you know were, were quoting this as justifying their hatred. Because, of course, all violence has to be justified. Always, all violence has to be justified with a tremendous lie. Violence can only be sustained by lies. And the, more, the bigger the violence, the, more the, the, the bigger the lies, and the more elaborate the language. Violence is sustained. That's so in countries where people are tortured, they don't say, uh, I'm a torturer. You know, they say, I'm a dance teacher, or whatever it is. Or they say, when they're going to torture people, they use funny phrases. They say, let's go tangoing tonight, you know, or whatever it is. Or, I think it'll be a scream tonight. Hideous things <laughs> like that, because they can't bear it. Because you cannot dislike people profoundly and still consider them to be human beings. Racism is simply, I think, unarguably, a crisis of, uh, of imagination, in this sense, to be brief. It is that for some reason or other, bigotry, people, some people cannot imagine that other people are their equals, whether they're Jews or blacks or whatever they are, or a different religion. That is the crisis of imagination, which can be brought around by this bigotry with which I was brought up, you see. Of course, this is a long time ago, and I'm able to laugh at it now, because, well, I'm able to laugh all the time, because <coughs> it's a long time ago, and now I'm utterly ridiculous, you know. It's, uh, I'm just a fiction, a famous fiction. Do you want to ask me another question? I was going to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting, um, about your, your upbringing with religion. Um, I was just thinking that you were a monk for, in Jersey, I believe, originally, and then in Shropshire. Yeah. Um, that discipline that you need to become a, a novice monk, it must be, you know, it's a very stifled life, isn't it, in many ways? Well, it's no more stifled, really, than, you know, I think that's a kind of receivism. It's no more stifled than an unsatisfactory relationship between a man and a woman, or two men, or whatever it is. You know, when people are caught, are stifled, actually, most people are stifled into relationships, actually, for economic reasons. I was stifling in, in, uh, in Jersey, everyone, the novice, the novitiate is called, goes on for one year. And after one year, you become what's called a scholastic, this fancy name, I don't quite know what it means. It means you can finish the one year. And then you enter to vows, you take vows. And that lasts for two years, then it's renewed for three years. And then at, at the following year, you take your final vows. But indeed, it was madly uh, disciplined. You know, there was hardly any conversation. It seems to me, looking back on it, it was the maddest time in my whole life, really, because I'm a very uh, gregarious sort of fellow. And there I was, locked in this monastery, where not only there wasn't much talking going on, which was quite difficult for me, uh, but there wasn't, you weren't allowed to look at each other. You, you know, this was, this was immodest. Uh, you weren't allowed to look at each other at all, so everyone walked with his head down, so naturally there were quite a lot of injuries because people tripped over things. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to put up with that. All eye the time. contact wasn't allowed at all. No eye contact at all. You were not allowed to look at people, no. How strange. Well, you know, the same old guff, isn't it? Same old bollocks, you know, the eyes are the windows of the soul. And you see, if people can't talk to each other, you know, then nothing can stop people communicating. Nothing can stop them, really, as long as they're, you know, as you can, of course, separate by thick So walls. how would the abbot know if a monk was unhappy without looking at his face? And well, I think that they were allowed to look into your oh, eyes, and th they were allowed to ask you hard questions, or, or allowed to keep on the indoctrination of why anyone would choose this very unnatural life, you know. But we, the, the, the monks themselves, the young monks themselves, are not allowed to look at each other, because when people look at each other, something happens. Uh, no, no, normally we look at each other and we smile or we, we offer each other wine or something marvellous like that. But otherwise, but they didn't want that, you see, because it was part of the annihilation of the will. Rather like, you know, in a brief way, like when you go in the army, they annihilate your will. When people go to drama schools, it used to be the old guff to annihilate your personality and rebuild it in some way. So, I mean, it was just crazy way. And, uh, 
And the other thing, it was very hard, you see, because, you know, we were very young men. I was only 15, and, uh, well, by the time I was a novice, I was only 15 and a half. And so naturally, I was in a state of sexual excitement at that time. I still am, I can't think of it. <laughs> 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 That's fine, because we're all crowded together. <laughs> it's, uh, but, you know, so actually, so I was there for six years, and so naturally, it was terrible to have a hard on for six years. I mean, it was very hard to, you know, bear, very hard. And so, you know, but then everybody had a stalk on. That's why they all walked with stoops. <laughs> I crouch forward, I don't, otherwise their dicks, <laughs> their dicks rub against the, the roughness of, of the, you know, this coarse wool. Yeah, it's terrible to have a grazed head on your dick. <laughs> but even that couldn't stop us. We were, we were, we were as stiff as skittles. <laughs> An amazing time, yeah. But that was disapproved of, you see. Because, you know, we weren't allowed, when we used to have showers, I mean, we were showered once a week, but that was under close supervision when we, uh, obviously there was no, look, you had to be extremely furtive to see anyone, but you were, we, then you were clothed in terrible shrouds, quite clean, beautiful, co coarse cotton shrouds, and then you went down a corridor with the shower operated by some demon at the end. <laughs> it was a good job for him, you know, seeing all these naked bodies, well, not naked, more interesting, you know, under mm -hmm. underneath linen things, and you washed yourself through the linen. How bizarre. Well, yeah, well, I suppose it is. I've given it up, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that now. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not that conservative. This is you couldn't gaze on another's body, I suppose. Well, yeah, you couldn't. The idea was you couldn't even touch your own body. That's why we all had a stalk on all the time. <laughs> and in the showers, I remember Gilda, the fellow who was in charge of the showers, they were sought after, or all, all the perverts, you know, ha wanted to do the novices when they were in the shower. Because you could actually, with these two wheels, actually, you know, uh, you know, raise the temperature to be scalding them, because you weren't allowed to scream. And they would, you know, they'd get it very hot, and then they'd get it very cold. It was kind of a... Uh, you see, that kind of discipline, that kind of education that was going on in many ways in some great public schools was actually what passed for education, what passed for discipline, actually was just simply abuse. It could be called brainwashing in some form. Well, I mean, that's another kind of abuse. I mean, there are lots of ways of abusing young people. There was sarcasm, indifference, too much noise, you can kill them with kindness. There are also infinite ways of being cruel to people. There's a very lovely Elizabethan play called A Woman Killed With Kindness. So it's, it's infinitely various. You know, we think just because of the tabloids, we think, you know, that, that, that child abuse is just the coarse abuse, you know, of pathetic paedophiles or whatever it is. When we all know, when we think about it for a few seconds, it's infinitely more subtle than that. It's very, people are able to make each other uh, unhappy forever by infinitely subtle means, much better than beating or sexual abuse. But that's a depressing story. Um, so there I was, locked off, swallowing all that guff, you see. And of course, you can't stop falling in love because it's a natural thing. The only thing is, when you can't see anyone, it's very difficult because we look at each other. Um, and so I had two problems because I was very affectionate. And still am, in a way. There's <laughs> 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 a, a story, isn't there, about you know, years ago when, uh, you know, when it was much more fun to be queer than it is now. So it's utterly commonplace. <laughs> and so people, people would say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Legal now, so it's ordinary and dull. Uh, but when it wasn't, we, what? <laughs> well, it's going to be compulsory soon. <laughs> well, people say people should say to you know, you'd say to someone at drama school, is it true that you know the terrible incidents of homosexuality in the theatre? They'd say, grossly exaggerated. <laughs> 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 and you think, when will he take his hand off my knee? <laughs> and it was much more fun then, you know, because there was an awful lot of cruising and despair and. And now, you know, it's just, uh, it's just like everything else. It's just a doddle now, isn't it? <laughs> so to be queer now, well, you don't even say queer. Although in New York, they want to be called queer again. But it was great and when, uh, when I was younger, and it was all that furtiveness and, and cruising and buying drinks. And, and, of course, it was a very good way for the working-class guardsmen, because the Queen's regiments in London were always, you know, full of male prostitutes who weren't at all queer. But they realised you know, it was a, it was beer money yeah. if they wanted to go with old boys who wanted to suck their dicks, <laughs> uh, and then you were always allowed uh, in those days. You see, the the boys who went home with oh, especially old queers, uh, they were you were always licensed in low life to steal a small object. 
It's very interesting, isn't it, all these elaborate things that went on. And so there was a kind of formula. And so they left a little, rather like a, a man might for a tart, not actually give her the money, but the money would be there in an envelope. And they would leave a little object that was very easily sold to realise some money. It was a kind of tip. I remember Francis Bacon, I remember the story. Francis, we were in, Francis Bacon was a great painter. Some of us were not too. He was a great painter. He, he died a couple of years ago. Francis Bacon was immensely rich. He left eight million pounds to his to his boyfriend, John Edwards, yeah, who looked after him the last few years of his life. Anyway, Francis used to take us to, he was a great host, he used to take us to Wheeler's in Old Compton Street. The oh, best the fish restaurant. Yeah, the fish restaurant. Superb, yeah. And he was, we were, we were sitting in the back bar, all you know, uh, with it together, supping, and uh, he drank a lot of champagne. And he had a very funny voice. Uh, he'd say, yes, I think we'll have a little lunch. He didn't say yes, he used to say yes, which was a big camera. Anyway. <laughs> We're in there one day, and there were three tables of Americans, really preppy Americans, you know, who really knew a lot about England, and they were having this very expensive lunch, you see. And Francis was there, and Geoffrey Bernard, Conan Nicholas, Dan Fasten, and me. And so Geoffrey suddenly said, uh, Francis said, Geoffrey, now you've lost your looks. How are you going to earn a living? <laughs> and so one thing led to another. They were talking about Sid Charisse and growing old. And we were deluding it, because Americans don't like to talk about growing old. <laughs> and Francis knew he had this amazing genius for disturbing people. And he knew it was causing a crisis among the Americans. It was spoiling their <laughs> lunch, you know, uh, which is what he was in. And the waiters, when Francis was, went into the uh, bar, uh, restaurant, people adored him because he'd say to the waiter, are you going to be attentive? <laughs> and the waiter would say, see, si, Monsieur Bacon, he'd say, right. There's a 50 to start with. <laughs> <laughs> to start with, what a wonderful phrase. So the waiters, you know, absolutely adored him all over that. I can imagine. Yeah. So, they, so when people, the Americans say, who is that dreadful man? They'd say, he's Mr. Bacon. Oh, psh. So they were thinking, who is this dreadful? And he was wearing leather gear, you know, he was with rues like me. Anyway, he suddenly started out on this story and he said, because he never gave up the cruising, he said, you know, I was in Paris the day before yesterday, Geoffrey. And I, I was very bored. I was at the George Sank, and suddenly I didn't know the time. And I said to myself, Francis, I think it's time you had a little watch. <laughs> Sad way to go on, he said, you know, things thing. He said, so I went and got myself a little Piaget. Yeah. He said, yes, it was only 9,000 pounds. <laughs> so the Americans instantly translated that into dollars, and you know, then they were slightly impressed. <laughs> so he said, anyway, he said, when I got back to London, he said, he said, I, I went down to Waterloo Station. He said, I pulled a matelow. So one of the waiters told the Americans what that meant. He pulled a sailor and got him back to South Kensington. He said, anyway, there I was lying on the bed like a vestal virgin. <laughs> <laughs> this is Francis 79, seeing himself as a vestal virgin. And he said, and the matelow was in the bathroom doing, I suppose, his ablutions or whatever the matelows do. The Americans were up. <laughs> and the, uh, the whole place was silent and waiters were leaning out, isn't he? He said, and anyway, I suddenly thought to myself, he's not having my Piaget. <laughs> <laughs> just to come back to the So he said, I slipped it off like that. He said, and I popped it under the mat. Just at that moment, out he came, three strides, Geoffrey. He was ever so athletic. Three strides from the bleeding bathroom. One, two, whoosh, went my fucking Piaget. <laughs> The Americans were appalled by this, and Francis waiting with infinite malice till, till the appalled, they just getting over that pain, and he remarked, it was the most expensive fuck I've ever had. <laughs> he was enjoying their discomfort. Absolutely. You know, so he was abusing them by you know, his time. extravagance and, you know, the watch being crushed by a randy sailor and all that sort of thing. And so, because he lived in that time, when Francis Bacon entered so came into Soho, people used to whisper, they'd say, Francis is on the piss. Because, you know, he, he worked in a very disciplined way. But when he'd finished working, whatever it was, he he had to get out of him. Then he'd, he'd hit Soho, you know, he lived in the South Kent. He'd hit Soho, and Francis Bacon was there, and Dan Fast, and Jeff Bernard, and me, and Francis, you know, who used to, you know, never mind a few quid, Francis used to have a lavatory roll of 50s, you know. <laughs> Absolutely incredible, which, you know, which he'd dish out to waiters, you know, paying their mortgages if they were nice. So this caused a lot of attention. He was very welcome everywhere. I should imagine. Yeah, <laughs> and, and in the economy well, yeah, room, which is a bit like this, uh, except it was green. 
we'd all be hugger mugger, you know, uh, avoiding life. That was the, the technique, wasn't it? We, the, the, the escape from life was the actual act of escape. We were looking all the time for these escape routes, and the escape routes were us locked together drinking champagne and talking bollocks, sometimes eloquent bollocks, but and then, <laughs> and then, move, then, then, you know, if you picked up a few uh, insults or something, you'd move off to another cabaret, which would be the French pub, or onto the Coast of Horses, or the Dirty Duck, or the Swiss Tavern. And we, so we were on this circuit of this terrible roundabout of self-destruction. If I may interrupt you a moment, it's very interesting. Well, if you must, have gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like, uh, when you... Uh, left being a monk, you did national service about, what, 21 when you did? And it was there you started to learn your love of acting. Was well, no, 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 no. I think that's another misapprehension. I learned <coughs> acting, you see, as a capacity, I suppose. You can say it in a small room like this. I don't blame you if you find it ridiculous. But acting as a, acting as a game, isn't it, an art or whatever you want to see, where people feign or fake emotions. Yes, so, in other words, actors are fakers. When it's very beautiful, perfectly done, especially with verse in Shakespeare, it carries the music of the verse carries. You think that was marvellous. And in more modern plays, there are wonderful actors and actresses. Not many, but there are some wonderful. And they, they move you, and, and they do it for you. And you think, yes, and you're nourished. Now, obviously, when I was going to church, to going to confession at six, I had to be quite ingenious about, because nothing much was happening to me at six, you see, except for the bombing and the old ladies bursting into flames. <laughs> uh, and the other old ladies sitting in the area shelters with their knees wide apart, as is the wont of old ladies. They get terribly immodest, don't they? But anyway, that's it another sad it's story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Actually, old ladies now, middle class old ladies, they have their children by them, these kind of, they have these little implants of magnets. Like there, like that. And so when they sit down, their knees are. <laughs> Otherwise, they sit like that, and everybody will shout, Winnie! <laughs> yeah, close that door. Well, anyway, anyway. Um, so when I was in, in going to church, it's amazing recording these things. You had to be inventive because you couldn't go, because you were self loathing, you know. People would, say, would often say to you, Tell me, Baker, in front, because we had these classes these self-loathing classes, and <laughs> Father Deacon would say, on the subject of we are nothing, what are you, Baker? You say, I'm nothing, Father. You say, what did he say? He said he's nothing, Father. What are you? I'm nothing, Father. Yeah. Baker, I'm nothing, Father. Say it loud, I'm nothing, I'm just nothing. Don't you ever forget it. Can you say it in Latin? Domini non sum dignus, Father. Yeah. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, that's right. But I mean, that's all part of the, of the eloquent drama of, of putting over a point of view. Nothing was left to chance. You can speak Latin fluently, can you? I can say I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I still say it. Uh, when, but I mean, no one believes me, or no one talks much Latin now. Uh, but uh, so, that was, so we had to get terribly inventive, you see. And so and the only way you get inventive, there's no such thing as kind of innate uh, you know, imagination. You have the innate capacity. But it comes from the stimulus of the things that happen around you. So other boys would tell us what to do, what to say, because we didn't know. You couldn't go to confession and say, Father, it's a week since my last confession, and since then I haven't committed a sin. <laughs> you couldn't say that. That was a sin. That was pride. We didn't know that. But I mean, so you had to say, you know, I've been disobedient, or I've, to my mother, or I've had an impure thought. That was very popular. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we made up. So I began to become a, a, a very accomplished liar which is another facet of acting, isn't it? It's lying. Of course, yeah. So, so mm. all that stuff about, and then trying to please the priests, you know, you'd say, uh, some boys would say, um, um, I, did a, I did an impure act. That was auto-eroticism, but then I hadn't met the middle classes of football matches by then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so you'd say that, and then the priest would say something absolutely appalling, like, did pollution take place? It was an amazing thing. And I'd say, well, I, I'm not certain, Father. You say, oh, right. So, you know, because <laughs> this whole life, I hope you're in the picture here. Yeah, so, to be the idea, so that yeah. was the way it was, you see. <laughs> Did pollution take place? It was a dreadful, dreadful way of looking at things, which was reinforced later in the monastery. So my, my, pr my not precision, my facility with words came from those terrible inventions, I suppose. And then, also, at the same time, this was in the days before penicillin, when life was really rather more exciting, I think, 
as long as you didn't get tonsillitis or a nail in your shoe. But uh, <laughs> so people died, you know, very easily. And I went to lots of funerals. And TV I, was what right. Happened, TV was yeah. right. T tonsillitis would clear all the old bags out in their <laughs> It was incredible. And so we'd go to three funerals a day. And it was at funerals, you know, where I, was, I thought I used to swing the incense. But I began to sniff incense with the working class boys. It wasn't against the law then. They still hadn't done all that. And so we were sniffing incense, mostly to alleviate our hunger. But this also, rather like Abbott's Green King, <laughs> caused hallucinations. <laughs> and we couldn't tell the one from the other, you know, because, I mean, the thing is about being a Roman Catholic, a very dedicated Roman Catholic, produced incredible internal tensions, you see, because, first of all, you believe that God is everywhere, uh, which shatters children, that God is absolutely everywhere, so you're being watched. But not only God is everywhere, but you've also got your bloody guardian angel on, the, on your shoulder, you know, this meant going to the lavatory was a terrific ordeal. <laughs> you, like, you, you, were, you, you were a bit shy. <clears throat> but there you were, grunting at stool, <clears throat> knowing that you were being watched by God and his angels. I mean, you, got, you never got any peace at all. And this was reinforced later on in the monastery, because this was deeper, more deeply believed. And so you were very carefully watched by everyone else. Rarely one, the rule said, rarely one. Never two. Never two. Always at least three and these long silences and the supervision. So this all, looking back on it, was preparing me for what I was to do, which is, you know, to tell my part of a, of a story in a play as an actor. It, that was, it was, you're quite right, you're, when I got to the army in the medical corps, they, they were rather theatrical because, you know, they were quite near their university days. All the officers were doctors, had to pass the time. Uh, they, they got up to lots of theatricals, you know, and I began to take part in them. And then when somebody said to me, you could do this, that's when I, uh, I flew for it. But, you see, I didn't know. Working class boys and girls didn't know how to do things like that. Lower middle class boys and girls, 30 years ago, didn't know what to do. You know, their teachers who were bright and had all been to Oxford. Girls, girls who, you know, got, got to Oxford 30 years ago, occasionally some of them, some of them became doctors, very few of them became architects or big senior managements or whatever. You know, they, they went on to teachers' training college and went and became, or, or they became senior secretaries. You know, they, people didn't know how to break out of Southampton or Liverpool, where I was. I didn't know how to become an actor. You know, no one in our family ever went to the theatre. So we didn't know what to do. But when a doctor said to me that I admired, Dr. Stafford said, you know, Tommy, you're very funny, you should be an actor. I thought, well, that's, that sounds okay, I'd like to do that without quite realising that's what I've been doing on and off for a long time. You've been trained without realising That's right. That. We're, we're, we are all, in a sense, being prepared for something if, you're, if your luck coincides with your, what you can do. And so there I was, you know, all prepared. And then, uh, and then I, he just rang the sergeant in the education corps who said, yeah, it's, uh, what, actor, fucking doddle, you know, here we are, <laughs> radar, radar, Ra Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, all these lists there, and you wrote off. And when you were in the army in the 50s, in the early 50s, when you came out, it was very easy to get grants if you could get accepted to a place. I couldn't get anywhere academic, of course, because I wasn't good enough. But when it came to acting, some, when it, an acting school, Liverpool were terribly impressed that I got into about <coughs> three places. And they said, this fella, you know, has got some kind of faci ghastly facility uh, to be convincing, even when he's not telling the truth, or especially when he's not telling the truth. And so that's how it got, all got going, yeah. Jumping ahead a bit. Is it true you were at a uh, review in York playing, a, I think, a dog or some kind of animal when a talent scout from the National Theatre spotted you? Well, that's right, yeah, that's right. I, mean, I was playing, a, uh, it was a cultural review. In York, years ago, there used to be a big music festival and there was no fringe at all. And so a friend of mine and I, I was at the York, York Theatre Royal, I jacked that in. And we wrote a review called Late Night Lowther because it was in a pub called the Lowther. And we had a stroke of genius. Laurie Taylor, the broadcaster, who was then a, you know, an actor with me. He later on became a professor or something. But so Laurie Taylor and I wrote this thing. We knew lots of people, and we, we you know, because we were shameless, of course. The first quality you need is to be utterly shameless to be an actor. Then you need the second quality is to be half in love with rejection, because that's what you're going to get. I mean, actors get more rejection than Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. They really, do. they really, and you can't live with that. You mustn't do it. So we had this amazing idea of writing this very funny review that was to alleviate the he Laurie being a, a reader at the university, we got a, a late night license for Lowther and called it Late Night Lowther. I bloody 
here's the scam. You couldn't go in for a late night drink unless you had a ticket for our show. <laughs> so naturally we were a fucking big hit. It was incredible. We were absolutely packed out. The whole pub was packed out because it was a scam. You know, we cheated people because they could only get about 100 people in the room upstairs. But we sold about 400 tickets every night because most of them just wanted the Abbot's Green King, I suppose. <laughs> and they were all hallucinating downstairs. And we were all making idiots of ourselves as a jazz group upstairs. And someone from the National Theatre, called an associate producer, uh, happened to be in York looking at people at the rep. They were always on the, on the prowl, you know, looking for... I, did, they, I didn't know what they were looking for. They, just, they weren't looking for just competent actors, they're ten a penny. They were looking for someone, they were looking for quirkiness, oddity, whatever it was. To was try. Lawrence Olivier running the National at this time? He was, he was. And so this fellow sent me a note and said, Tom, why didn't you come down? I'll fix a, an interview. They, had, they were very democratic of the National. Mm -hmm. If you applied, you, you, you know, your turn came, and they had these big interviews. It didn't usually mean much because most people rejected. Anyway, but so I went down there, and here's a bit of luck, to meet Lawrence Olivier. You and actually interviewed him in the cell? He, had, he used to sit in. I mean, he didn't actually, you know, he yeah. would sit there and terrify everyone, although he didn't mean to. And he'd be surrounded by his staff, and you'd do a few things and answer a few questions or tell a story. But when I went down there, I was still in this play, you see, in this show in York, so I had to go down overnight. And, which was slow in those days, and then still get back all the way back to York right. for the show. Mm -hmm. And they knew that at the National, they were very nice, you see. And the crisis was, Olivia was held up at some sip of dubbing session at Pinewood, and he was very nice and sentimental. And his secretary rang in and said, there's a, a chap, isn't he, he's supposed to see, yes, he, he can't come, he, for, he's going to be an hour and a half late. So everyone was gathered round me being terribly nice. And so by the time I, he came, you know, I was absolutely wrecked with anxiety, but I spun them a few yarns. You know, I realized we were no good trying to do modern drama down there. And just on the, uh, you know, suspicion that they didn't read anything, which was probably right, I just told them a story, you know, and, and invented, I said, this is a play called Blame Me on History by William Fleming, who's an uncle of mine, couldn't write. <laughs> and I said, I was the part of Charlie, you know, talking to his grandma. And so I just told them this story, which of course I could tell very, very glibly. And they were very impressed. There, must have been something there, a germ or something of, of talent. That well, I, mean, I was trying to impress him, you see. I couldn't impress him by being a reasonable actor because the place is crawling with them. I mean, to be, it's like a girl trying to get, become a supermodel because she's pretty, you know. I mean, to be pretty is to be utterly commonplace. In Doctor Who, when we changed the girl over, you know, we'd have seven, eight hundred applicants. And you'd see all these photographs of all these gorgeously pretty girls. So it's a high anxiety there. And to actually get noticed, you know, people would sometimes look at you and you knew they weren't seeing you because you were like, as far as they turned, like the next person or the next one or the ten before. And suddenly, you know, Olivia was, I could see him looking at me, you know. And then he came up to me himself and he said, listen, they used to call, when he couldn't remember your name, which was often, he used to call you Baby. It was a bit funny that way. But I got to know him. <laughs> and he used to call me Baby, you know, or Boise. I used to call him Sir John. That really used to drive me <laughs> Oh, my dear Lord. But he came up and he said, because he was absolutely autocratic, he said, you must come to the National. I said, what for? Instantly thinking, you know, is he going to name? Because, the, you know, he said, I don't know what for. It'd be nice to have you here. <laughs> and there you are. Now, the following year, apropos of that, I, he, I was seen playing this dog, which got me noticed, because uh, I've got great reviews. I got to the National Theatre, and uh, the, the next thing is, they were casting the travails of Sancho Panza, uh, not that I had read the whole of uh, <coughs> Don Quixote, but um, so you always had people rooting for you. And someone who came running to the pub one day, we're often in the pub, said, Tom, we're doing the travails of Sancho Panza, and you know, I think we can get you into this. Oh, I said, well, I'm Donald, I said, this is fantastic. You know, I was born to play Don Quixote. He said, Don Quixote? <laughs> no, he said, Ted Godfrey's doing that. We're looking for someone to play the fucking horse. <laughs> 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 so there you are, you know. <laughs> and so, there, so that brought me down a bit. You know, but however, as luck as fate is infinitely capricious, uh, there I was playing the horse, uh, playing the whole horse and towing a little trolley behind me and, you know, and going to movement classes with a girl called Claude Chagrin, who was very clever at all that sort of thing. And, but the play was being directed, here's luck for you, by Joan Plowright, Lawrence Olivia's wife. And Lawrence Olivia was absolutely uxorious, don't you know, he was, he, he was absolutely besotted with his wife. It was an incredible thing. 
everything that was, uh, he thought was wonderful about women was embodied by Joan. This is not unusual in middle-aged men, late middle-aged men, because unlike women who, who find it difficult to have, obviously, for obvious reasons, to have a second family, after the tragedies of his first two or three wives, and he was already in middle age, he meets this dynamic Lincoln girl, who then actually, he is reborn, you see. So he fell in love with her, his dick came back to life. <laughs> <laughs> he knocked out three children, and, uh, and was talking about cricket to young men like me, you know. So he was reborn, so the source of this rebirth was Joan Plowright. So, so the whole thing made sense, it was simply wonderful. He should, so he should be gratified to being brought back from the dead of just being a big star. So suddenly he was a, an ordinary, vibrant family man again. So she was directing this play, you see, where I would play the horse. And Lawrence used to come in, Larry used to come in, to watch some of the rehearsals. And he always had, he had a, I discovered he and I were very alike in the fact that we both had marvellous bad taste. <laughs> and he liked oddity. And when he used to watch me rehearsing this horse and towing this little trolley and Derek Godfrey uh, being able to leap on the trolley and me being able to, you know, do these little movements to suggest the horse. Um, he, he got to know me, you know. And Joan said, he's very funny, Larry. And so I started going to parties there. And the next thing is, I was playing human beings. <laughs> what well, sort of were giving it in a coarse way, but that's what uh, I was doing there. Didn't he help you get the role of rescue? Well, he mar mar marked it. He was, the following year, he was doing a, a play, or a year after, he was doing a, a film, Nicholas Alexander, a very long film, the big film. Very good picture. Yeah. And, um, and they hadn't cast Rasputin, and Larry, who was a marvellous old show-off, you know, Sam Spiegel said, we can't uh, cast uh, Rasputin or something, he's talking that funny Polish way. Um, Larry said, I could. He loved saying things like that. I could. He said, he was, you know, a lot of living around Bathory, he used to actually talk with his tongue in his cheek. <laughs> yeah, he, he'd say, it's so nice to see you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and he was always telling us not to have mannerisms. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, baby, is <laughs> I think you uh, shouldn't have any kind of uh, <laughs> mannerisms. You know, it gets it's in the way of performances. Well, you know, you, we used to look at him incredulously, but he loved us, you know, because he was rather autocratic and he loved us like chickens. And so he said he could cast Rasputin. He had a Rasputin, mm -hmm. very kind of him, to say that. In you were actually casting that. You were well, uh, I, well, that year I something it was. I was lucky, and so Sam Spiegel gave it to me, and for a while I was toying with being a movie star, you know. Um, but fate saw otherwise. But it was a good time. It was a happy time. <laughs> you know, being Rasputin was amazing because you know when we toured America afterwards, it got a lot of publicity, you know, and of course there were an awful lot of girls who wanted to lay Rasputin. <laughs> <laughs> So I was in a terrible state. I mean, I really was well, absolutely polaxed. Because it's funny, you know, pe because you know the, pub the people believe the publicity about this ravenous, uh, satiriasist monk that I was playing, and so they thought they'd try me out, you know. And um, yeah. it wasn't actually a monk, then, was it? Well, he wasn't a monk. He was called a starlet. But I mean, we've called him a monk to simplify things. A starlet was a kind of self-styled holy man. But uh, I mean, the 19th century, you must understand. For those of you who don't know a bit about the history of religion and uh, uh, the changes that were going on in there, the 19th century was an amazing time for two main reasons. One, of course, was uh, geology. The second one must have been Darwin. <laughs> and the third one, of course, was true, was Freud. And those movements were in the air, and people were beliefs, you know, geology actually unlocked universal doubt among the intelligence and, of course, made nonsense of, of biblical commentary. So, you know, these, they, they were in courts, uh, Russia and elsewhere, they were tired of the old forms, and these new doubts were there. And out of nowhere comes Rasputin to a family where they've got a, a child who is a haemophiliac, and this man has the capacity to lay hands and calm the child, who is the heir to all of the Russias. Yeah, it's a good story. And so the a true one as well. A true story, yeah. And so you have a lot of power. And so when I came, that year I played him, you know, it got a lot of attention. You know, because I had a long beard and they knocked a bit out of the front where he'd been kicked by a horse. I think that's where his madness came from. He'd been kicked by a horse and actually behaved one. You know, he was a stallion from then on. <laughs> <laughs> was that directed by Franklin J. Schaffner? It was. was. I was only thinking the other day that nearly everybody is dead on that picture except, well, not the three children, but uh, Janet Sussman, well, Michael Jason, 
and me are, yeah, still alive, but Frank Schaffner's dead, Sam Spiegel, John Box, or mm. they've all died now. Good people, yeah. Harry Andrews, Jack Hawkins, and people like that. Well, one of the performance that I really do like of yours, it's the film I suppose you call Hogan, but I, I like it, is Golden Voyage of Sinbad. You were so good in that film, I thought. Well, thank you, but that was what led to Doctor Who, because it was on next door to the BBC, <laughs> where producers are notoriously lazy, and so when it came for me to have Doctor Who to get to the point, Bill uh, Slater had recommended me, and I happened to be in a film, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and it was right next to Threshold House. And so three or four chaps who were powerful, went to see it one afternoon, and then they thought, yeah, he, he'll do all right, and then they, they sent for me. You were unemployed at the time. No, you were in, on a building site, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very interesting just... to come back from a big Hollywood movie and be sleeping on someone's floor and on a building site. But, I mean, in a sense, that was par for the course. You know, I talk about this rejection, about this high state of anxiety. I think that's why actors are often generally so nice, you know, because they live in a terrible state all the time. And some actors, of course, slip away. I, I'm very philosophical about my own little success. Well, not little success. I mean, in terms of Doctor Who, it was a huge success. It was 93 countries. You know, it was everywhere in the whole world. So it was a huge success, and the only huge success I've ever had. But, I mean, I have known and still know <coughs> many distinguished actors that I wouldn't, out of kindness, name now, who don't work as they should, you know. I was, we were talking about one in the car just now, Freddie Jones, wondering why he is very more fine, on television. Very fine. Actor. Very fine. Yeah. Michael Jason himself has remained a friend of mine. He doesn't work so often as he should. It's incredible. Um, but that's the way it goes. You know, it attracts people who like anxiety, who like <coughs> insecurity, uh, which is very, very strange. Because most people want security, most people want to be liked or to be loved. I used to be like that, now I want to be adored and see how pathetic that is. <laughs> but, um, and so, you know, it wasn't so unusual. Yeah, I was well known in the pub. They'd all seen me at Nicholas Alexander and couldn't believe I was on a building site. People think, general public assume an actor who's resting is not, not actually working. That's not true. You, you're probably working as a barman or a waiter. Or yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's you can't just stay at home and wait for the rest. No, you can't. Right? No, you can't. It's terrible. And, you, and how, do you stay, you, how do you practice it, you see? You, if you play <coughs> the flute or something, you can practice the flute or the piano, but you can't practice acting except in groups. So now actors go to workshops, or often older actors like me will go back and do revision courses with younger actors, or will become directors in drama schools anything, you know, to keep it going. Of course, there are non-broadcast commercial opportunities in, in places where people are learning how to cope with television cameras or how to phrase things or how to avoid obvious traps in interviews or whatever. There are quite a lot of actors who, who are not so famous as actors who, who turn out to be extremely good at that. And then, of course, like me, at, at the age of 64, not now, I'm nearly 66, at the age of 64, writing a book and then last year writing another one, which is out now. How much, I mean, when you grew up as, as a boy in Liverpool, there were very few books in your house, yeah. if, if any. Yeah. Do you surround, I mean, you've become a writer now, you've written uh, collected short yeah, yeah, stories, yeah, yeah, written two right. books as such. Is this a new, uh, something you want to pursue more? Well, I mean, you have to do lots of things, really. If, if someone gave me a television series, obviously I wouldn't have time to write, but now that I can use a word processor, I thought I should write, and, uh, and then when I used to take the stuff down to my wife uh, <coughs> at night and, and read to me, and uh, read to her at night, and if she, uh, you know, at, while she was making the dinner, if she was falling around laughing or throwing up, I, I liked to see reactions, um, <laughs> then you know, I, I, I was onto a winner, and I thought to myself, but my Sue, who knows me so well, and you know, and she's not at all daft, she's a lot younger than me. So she must be deaf somewhere, but um, <laughs> but she was laughing, and then you know, when it came, I, had, I became a writer. I'll be very quick about this. That's right. So what? So I I wrote about twenty five thousand words, you see, of a manuscript two years ago. My autobiography, who on earth is Tom Baker? And um, so I rang Jackie Lane, who looks after me for voiceovers. It's an area in which I can be very sincere. If the money is right. <laughs> so, uh, I said, I said to Jackie, Jackie, how do I get um, how do I get a, a, a literary agent? And she said, Why, darling? Because she's known me for donkey's years. 
Why? I said, well, I've got this manuscript I've written. Oh, she said, I said, yeah, 25,000 words. And I went, she said, I'll find out for you. So the next day, I was going up to London. She said, I'll speak to Rosalie at Harper Collins, where actors record <coughs> books. So she rang Rosalie. So that's late in the afternoon, you see. So the next morning, I'm going up to town. I said, I'll talk to you. She said, I'll talk to Rosalie. So the next morning, I'm up in town being sincere over paint or something. <laughs> really wonderful like that. And so I rang Jackie and said, what happened about Rosalie? Did she give you any tip? She said, darling, when I rang Rosalie and said, Rosalie, how do you get a literary agent? Rosalie said to Jackie, she said, why, darling? Well, she said, because Tom Baker, you know, I look after him. He's, he's got a manuscript and he's looking for a literary agent because he doesn't know what to do next. But she said, hold on a minute. So she rang back to Jackie and said, I've just been talking to the head of nonfiction. He'd be delighted to read Tom's manuscript. But Jackie told her, so the next morning I get this information, see? So I said, oh, Christ, I'll be free in an hour. She said, well, it's Michael Fishwick at this number. So I, I said, all right. So I did the voiceover, rang Michael Fishwick. He was effusively glad. To he said, Tom was so excited about reading a manuscript by you. Uh, I said, well, I'll bring it in, Michael. it be nice to see you, cock. Where are you? He said, I mean, well, we're in Hammersmith. Oh, I said, fuck it, I'm not going to Hammersmith. I was in Soho. I said, I don't go to Hammersmith, Michael. I don't want to be a writer. I've gone off the whole I said, <laughs> <laughs> He said, where are you? I said, I'm in Broadway Street. He said, I'm going to the Groucho Show for lunch. I'll be I there. Know, well, yeah. in, in, I'll be there in about 35 minutes. I'll come in a cab. I'll see you there. So I said, OK. So I sauntered over there. And he was a very nice man, uh, extremely sharp. And uh, he said, do you want to have lunch with me and Michael? I said, no, no, thanks. So I had a, a coffee with him, gave him my little packet, and buggered off. I think I saw Michael Jason, and we had a glass of beer. I went off to a couple of bookshops. And I got home about 5 o'clock, and my wife waiting here, looking very flushed at the door, which she's often flushed when she sees me. <laughs> she's a complete victim. Uh, and so she said, Christ, she said, Harper Collins are on the phone. They want to buy that manuscript. I said, it all happened in a day. In a day, I said, you know, a manuscript. You know, the previous night, one phone call to Jackie, and the next day I was a writer. Uh, so sometimes when I talk or read to people, you know, I try to encourage them about that. Of course, it, I had the advantage of getting it read, because most people trying to start with plays or, or books, how do they get them read? Uh, that's difficult, uh, and I just happened to fall right. So that was only two years and a bit ago, and here I am now promoting this boy who killed, kicked pigs, um, you know, hoping that... I mean, people have described it as depraved and it's controversial. And as les lesbian groups have been throwing up in public at the, at the death scene. <laughs> and so I've got great hopes for it. <laughs> <laughs> when you were writing a biography, wasn't the original title All Friends Betrayed? It was. Why did you want to call it that? Well, because I thought it was a good title. <laughs> it is. It's, it's oh, you've got to get off on a title. When The Boy Who Kicked Pigs came, the title came to me. And when the title came to me, I thought I'd write a novel about that. It's funny how small, do you know Dickens used to work like that? Dickens couldn't really get going until he found the title. He'd have the ideas, and he was always stumbling around. And then when David Copperfield and Nicholas Nickleby came, he was away. So when I found this boy who kicked pig, sounds good, doesn't it? It's meaningless, but it sounds good, and that's important. It makes you wonder what the book's about. That's right, yeah. yeah. And so there we are. Now it's, uh, it's, you know, it's on websites all over the world. So presumably yeah. somebody with your biography got to change it from All Friends Betrayed to Who on Earth is Tom Baker? Yes, they did. I think it was a mistake. Who on Earth is Tom Baker was exploiting my image as Doctor Who, whereas All Friends Betrayed by Tom Baker would have taken in the two. That would have been a beguiling thing. Yes, uh, it would have been a beguiling yeah. thing, and Tom Baker was well known, and my picture was on, would have been on the front anyway. So I think All Friends Betrayed was, uh, you know, that's another story, I think. Somewhere. Perhaps there's another autobiography in you. Maybe well, maybe possibly. there is, yes. I think actually the next one will be called Tom Baker, the true biography, autobiography. Because <laughs> the last may have been, you know, kind of Green King, Abbott's Ale. <laughs> 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 because all biography, you know, is just select all autobiography is selected confessions. And of course, the very best bits, <clears throat> as far as the public were concerned, co I couldn't publish. Because obviously, I couldn't publish them either, either for legal reasons or for just the moral reasons that you're not free. To, to reveal all sorts of things about yourself, which would be interesting, but which wound other people. You've, that's got to be considered all the time. You've got to be a little bit fair about those sort of things. So um, Your book's very interesting because, like all lives, it's, it's happy and sad, and, and the, the, the high points of your life and the low points. I was reading it on a train. I had to stop reading it because I was just laughing out loud. 
And it's very embarrassing when you're sitting on a train with <laughs> people and you're laughing your head off because you think you're absolutely a raving lunatic. Uh, yeah, or else you're but an actor looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But we've got a, we're casting a laughing part. What's that noise over there? <laughs> <laughs> you have a talent, obviously, for, for writing, though, to be able to, to create laughter off a written page. Yeah. But I didn't know that, though, you know, until I tried it, you see. And then, and I also on di bits of dialogue and things like that, you know, I, I actually say it aloud. I don't just hammer it straight onto the page. But yeah, maybe I have. But I mean, if I have, so can anybody. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of writers. Well, it is a talent writing. writing. I mean, well. you're, you're a very accomplished actor. I mean, writing is a different thing altogether. You, you seem to yes. have uh, I hope you write more. Well, I mean, I think I will write more. Because it doesn't look as if anyone's going to offer me a, an acting job. Oh, <laughs> I've just been in. You've got quite a few things coming up there, haven't you? Mm, I've got seven episodes of Randall and Hopkirk, and I've got this awful pile of dog shit called uh, um, <laughs> Dungeons, and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Isn't there Lord I of the Rings thought, as well? No, Lord of the Rings is now in, in shooting. That's the biggest film project in the world, and will be for the next two years. No, they did ask me when they filmed me at the interview. They said to me. If we offered, they, didn't say, they said, if we offer it, would you go away for 15 months? So quick as a flash, I said, piss off. I'm not going anywhere for 15 months. You know, at my age, I'm not going to leave my wife and my cats and my little old school that I live in uh, for 15 months for a job. I'm not. So, I mean, so they, so they didn't review it or they didn't ask me to do anything smaller in the film. They gave it to two Ians, Ian McKellen, so Ian McKellen and Ian Homer playing the two leads. They originally, because they're greedy and rapacious and obvious and American, which is the same thing, really, uh, <laughs> they, they wanted Sean Connery, as if Sean Connery would go to New Zealand for 15 months. Nothing wrong with New Zealand, it's paradise. But if your base is somewhere else and you're in middle age, you don't want to go to those places for 15 months. Do you regret months. not doing it now? Or no. You don't? No, I don't. I, I mean, when I went to do Dungeons and Dragons, a Canadian film, I didn't know anything about these computer games. There was a board game, computer game, now a film. It's interesting, the genesis of the film now might be a computer game. Uh, and so it was a Canadian company, and I, I didn't really read the script very carefully because it was an awful pile of whippet shit. And, uh, <laughs> so I just thought, well, they were paying in dollars, and I thought, well, I might as well do it. And, um, and it, I, I thought it said elk, an elk. Well, because yeah, I'm big enough to play an elk. <laughs> <laughs> it's it it a Canadian, but I got there, it was a fucking elf. <laughs> There was this dreadful little man <laughs> called Corey, someone, the director, you know, a kind of look alike, terrible look alike, Steven Spielberg, and a funny voice. I'm, I'm, I'm your director. And I knew I was getting off to bed, so I couldn't resist it. He's this awful little creature said, I'm your director. And I said, You're not. He was surrounded by lots of, all, you know, the lighting photographer and the first and second assistant, and everyone like that. I said, You're not. He said, I am. <laughs> he had no sense of irony at all. <laughs> uh, and so I said, you couldn't be a director. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, every, and I said, he's having me on, isn't he? Who is this? So, so we got off to a bad start. And then I discovered it was an elf. <laughs> an elf. So I just sort of said, well, you know, maybe in Canada. Perhaps he reached asked you after that conversation. Well, maybe he did. I mean, but who cares, you see? If you're in a film, you, don't, you just do for money. And, and, and the script can be changed any time you like. You know, as soon as you get on a film and they want to change the script, you know, they think, well, it could be anything. I mean, you know, the whole thing, a film starts with an idea and then a script. That's what the whole thing hinges on. And then when you get there, if they're changing the script willy-nilly, you know, it's a pile of whipping shit. <laughs> they're not certain about it. You know, they say, so you, in this one, the man makes a proposition and you say, yes, yes. And you say, I can do that. He said, great, that was marvellous, Tom. He said, now, we'll do it again, and this time say, no, no. I said, why is that? Well, he said, we might change our mind at the end. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, we don't know what the, st what the film is about. Really. And so there am I playing an elf, you know, which had everyone in convulsions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, including me, actually. Very hard masking my giggles, you know. And very hard, when they rewrote it that morning, I arrived. Very hard to learn, you know, usually at a few rehearsals. You can tack a script uh, on the side of your brain, but I found it very difficult. It really was the most unutterable nonsense. <laughs> but it didn't matter, you know, because I was being paid, uh, and they kept me waiting 10 days in Prague on ferocious expenses. So it was quite nice, you know, as I went around giving lots of beggars big 
tips and things. <laughs> In the hope that one day there might be film directors, you know, being, <laughs> being part of with a decent script. You have to do things like that. Because, you know, beggars now, you can't be certain. There was a time, now that I'm nearly 66, I recall that actually beggars seem, seem to me really beggars. But now, when you go, you know, sometimes... Oh, I saw an old bag lady in the Strand the other day, and I'm sure it was Polly Toynbee of the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. And, you know, I thought she's... research. Yeah, research. That's right, she's doing research. Well, sometimes you, you say to someone, you know, here's a pound, or I have two pounds, and they say, thank you very much. And you say, good God, Alan Howard. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, fuck off, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, re I'm researching the lower depths, you know, we go into rehearsal next week. Or it might be some middle-class trollop. You know, so so ashamed of having a happy background and going on holidays and having a nice complexion, she's trying to look wrecked in order that you know she can write a novel. Uh, because you know, because having been brought up with a nice complexion and happy and not being abused, she's not going to be much of a novelist. You see, so they lie around and so you'd never know whom you're talking to. Uh, you just don't know anymore. So um, so I research them. It's extremely difficult to think when a fellow reaches out and says, "Thanks very much, Governor." And you notice he's got a, you know, a Rolex watch on. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got lob shoes, you know, or perhaps a cashmere jumper. <laughs> and, and you can smell, you know, he's got aftershave, you know, Pecksniff or something like that. And you think, hmm, <laughs> maybe I'm part of somebody's cabaret. But on the other hand, when you've got a few quid in your pocket, it's a way of just getting, you know, be, uh, making a, you join the cabaret. You see, the disgusting thing about beggars, and sometimes I'm quite harsh on them, and then I give them money uh, after making the point, the disgusting things about beggars is that it creates a kind of, nowadays, when the, the sad mantra of, have you got, have you got any small change? And then the next one says, have you got any small change? You say, just a minute, you've just nicked that fucking line from that fellow down the road. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the said, have you got any small change? And you think, these guys have all got the same agent. Or if they haven't got the same agent, they've all got the same fucking scriptwriter. <laughs> and so I say, listen, you've got to get yourself a new scriptwriter. But they're lazy, you see. But the, the, the disgusting thing about someone saying, the back sheesh, as they said in Africa and the Middle East, or, or have you got any small change? And I give him small change. It diminishes me, the giver. Because, you know, we are a common humanity, and I give him a... I don't want that. What I want him to do is give me a performance, not a very long performance, because I'm usually quite pressed. But if someone steps up and says, God bless you, sir, you've been chosen. And I say, have I? He says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says, it's the anniversary of my wedding. Now. I'm just getting a bottle of Millie and Shandon together, and I've got three pounds, and it's only 16 pounds, sir, because it's not vintage. <laughs> and I'll be ever so grateful if you'd let me have the other eight. <laughs> and I say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you one and ask the next prick. He says, <laughs> and now you've bought his act. And now the beautiful thing is you're equal. And that is the beautiful. To be equal is beautiful. To create imbalance like that is ghastly and diminishes both sides of the operation. So I'm a bit severe if they haven't got a good line. If, if they haven't got a good line, I give them a couple of good lines. It says to me, he'd give us 20 pence for a pint of it. It's 40, get me one as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You, we both go, it was a very cheap pub, yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was also quite nice when sometimes they say, you know, have you, uh, have, you got, have, you got, have you got 20 pence for something to eat? I say, 20 pence? Listen, can't you get ambitious or something? <laughs> You're depressing me. I mean, ask me for the price of a bottle of scotch, for Christ's sake. You know, be, think big. And if I says, crusty things, because I've got a persuasive drink, he said, all right. He said, give us the price of a bottle of scotch. And you say, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and then, he, then he's learned something. <laughs> yeah, he's learned something. Yeah. I might go back later and throw a pound in his lap or something like that. Uh, has anyone got a question I'd like to ask Tom Baker? Do you have a question? Or? Yeah. That's to be the only person to have two copies in Manchester Swords. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know about that, really. Uh, but it was amazing to be a Madame Two Swords because, you know, it was very, it was very flattering. It's very flattering when people want to paint your picture and, uh, and make models of you and things like that. Um, so, yes, it was a very nice feeling. You know, occasionally I went in there for charitable reasons because I don't much care for waxworks. But uh, I, I, I used to stop. It's funny, isn't it, about uh, confessing these little vanities. My wife called me up on the internet the other night. I mean, I was standing next to her, so I didn't know what she did. <laughs> but she's a bit odd, although she's young. So she calls me up on the internet. She said, just look at that. And so there it is, Tom Baker, whatever it is. And you know, the number of pages on the top. Or you Six, she said, look at that. 6,000 pages about you on the internet. I said, well, really? Let's have a look. She said, look there, 6,000 pages. 
And she looked at me for a reaction. And I have to confess to you, because you won't tell anyone else, I was rather disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would have been more than that. <laughs> but there you are. So, you know, one is flattered. The thing is that when you're a big uh, popular fiction, you, those are the kickbacks you get, aren't they? That people recognize. Yeah. Especially when you play only really my success, benevolence. And so people mostly smile at me, you know, or uh, whatever it is, or, or say nice things, or talk about their childhood. I have access. To have been a children's hero, you know, to enter any house is an amazing thing. Yeah. You think, I am, you know, the only man in the United Kingdom that don't talk to strange men because of this ghastly time we live in, you know, where the relationship between fathers and children, never mind, old men like me who, can't no, who can no longer s buy children ice cream in a shop mm. or say to the woman, give them a bar of chocolate when they're gone because someone knocking at your door saying, why are you giving my children yeah. sweets? You know, I know, I, know, I know two young men who, who no longer bath their, their little babies. It's sad, which isn't is it? terribly sad. Yes, you see? Yes. Now, when I was doing Doctor Who, it was arms open everywhere. And everyone loved me because by association, people who didn't care about Doctor Who, like grannies, grannies adored me because the children were buried there heads in their granny's bosoms. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful, wasn't it? And so, so the, they, they loved me, you see. And so when these old grannies would see me in the street and their tits started to feel <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know why. They'd say, hello, dear. <laughs> oh, they said, who's that man that makes my bosoms tingle? <laughs> and it was Doctor Who, you see. So everyone was, was glad to see me, and that was simply wonderful. And of course, I have to remind you, at least I'm very good at commonplaces, is that moving pictures still pictures, but moving pictures, much more so, confer immortality on people. A kind of immortality. It never goes away. If we think about the great stars that we admire, they're not dead, they're still alive. They're, the people are dead, but the artist is still alive. We, we, we never knew Humphrey Bogart or James Stewart or whatever. And all the work is there. And Cagney and all the musicals, it's all there. It doesn't matter. So in that sense, moving pictures convey a sort of immortality. Yes, it's, uh, and it's never gone. Time frozen, that's isn't right, it? and it's yes. never gone yeah. away from me. You see. Yeah. So all over the world, there are still people <coughs> who think of me as Doctor Who. And fans are not like ordinary human beings because usually fans, the, the love of fans, the affection of fans, doesn't die away in real life. We run out of love. Love doesn't always last. And growing old is sometimes humiliating. And um, and ambitions aren't realized, and bottoms sag, and tits become pendulous, and then <laughs> got, got the chilling thrill of the first varicose vein, you know. <laughs> thing, uh, fuck it, let's have another drink. <laughs> Any other questions for Tom? Um, if the if BBC commissioned a new series of Doctor Who, and they phoned you up and asked you by the magic of television to be reincarnated again as a Doctor, would you do it? Well, uh, it's a ni it's a nice question, isn't it? I would consider it, obviously, because I, mean, I, I consider absolutely anything to pass the time. <laughs> uh, but if they said that, I mean, they'd have to have a reason, would they? For some reason or other, the doctor would now be old, 700 years old, even though he had two hearts. Uh, so I might consider it if they had a good idea. But more importantly, I think if they were really witty and they revived it, they're obviously clever things, so the BBC won't think of it. <laughs> and certainly Amblin Productions in America won't think of it because the Doctor Who development of film is in the hands of Spielberg's company, Amblin. They won't think of it. What they really should do is to bring me back as the master. But they don't think like that, you see. They're not really clever. They're not as clever as, as you people are who can imagine that or as actors who know perfectly well that in fictional drama and conflict, Holmes cannot really exist without the notion of yes, Moriarty. very interesting, yeah. Doctors, you know, when they say trying to get us better, doctors don't really want us to be better. They would have, they'd all be out of work, wouldn't they? <laughs> I mean, you know, pri prison officers actually adore the, you know, the prisoners because they'd be out of work as well. Uh, and so it is that the ultimate pa social paradox is that the most important people in the whole world, and have been for a long time, are the poor, because it's the poor that generate middle class employment. If it wasn't for the poor. The degree of unemployment among middle class carers and advisors and uh, and counsellors and whatever it is in charity, they'd all be they'd all be buggered. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when they when they talk now about clearing the streets of beggars, it's disappointing us to some extent because it appeals to those ghastly impulses that you know we want everything that's unpleasant out of sight. I mean, when it comes to genetic engineering, you know, I suppose in the future there will be no imperfect people. 
and that's a ghastly scary terrible yes but i, I mean when i go to beggars when i'm going into a restaurant at night i don't mind stepping over a beggar who's saying christ i haven't had a meal for a fortnight you know perfectly well he's lying <laughs> and when you go in you think christ he's lying there in the cold you know we're going into rules now for a good old piss up <laughs> then you've got a contrast haven't you but i mean if it was like bloody oslo or you know or gothenburg or these places or, or certain or parts of Belgravia. There are no beggars in Belgravia. Do you know why there are no beggars in Belgravia? I'll tell you, because there's no rules about it. There are no beggars in Belgravia because the fucking rich are too mean. <laughs> the beggars know. The beggars are businessmen. They may not be very good at it, but they're businessmen. The reason why there are no beggars in Belgravia or Mayfair is the rich don't give to the poor. And that's the end of it. So the beggars go towards the poor. And it's the respectable working poor who always give it out, who always give yeah, the stuff true. out. And they, and they know that, you know. and, and so therefore, it's quite nice to have uh, to be surrounded by a certain amount of squalor, isn't it? You see, without you see, when I said about the poor, the other important class in our society are the criminal classes. Uh, I'm not, of course, saying that it's a good thing to be a criminal or whatever it is. And I can't remark on that. I'm just deducing from it. But without the criminal classes, where would literature be? There'd be no fucking movies. <laughs> For a start, there'd be nothing on television, would there? Except bloody programs about cookery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because in our, in our, the paradox in our real life is that we want our lovers to be loyal and passionate, and our children to be healthy and kind and obedient, perhaps, and nice, and the neighbours not to be too noisy, and we don't want any trouble in the street. That's fine. That's what we want in real life, and we want good health ourselves. But in fiction, we want tumult and treachery and adultery and fornication and genocide. Otherwise, you, otherwise there'd be no fiction. Uh, so that, therefore, we can live the two lives. We can live the wonderful life of our own, raising our families or not, or getting on with our lives. And then in the wonderful world of fiction, we enter into other worlds, which are often very various. Mm. And without those kind of things, we couldn't enter into those worlds and enjoy fiction. But without the, the evil and the contrast and the squalor and the violence and misunderstanding, of ordinary humanity, there wouldn't be any fiction. That's what it's all about, isn't it? The thing is, life may be, truth is stranger than fiction, it's just not so well organized. The power of fiction is that, you know, it can be organized into 230 pages, and then you have a great novel by Philip Roth, say, like Sabbath's uh, Theatre, or American Pastoral, or whatever it is, or Goodbye Columbus. Mm, good, 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 that was. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, I uh, my favourite film role of yours, I think, was in Vault of Vault of Terror. I think it was horror. A, horror, sorry, big <laughs> Um and uh, which was most unusual. I thought I never, it's the first time I'd seen you in a horror film. I hadn't seen uh, any of the other ones. No, of, well, I, I can't remember much about Vault of Horror except that Terry Thomas was very funny. Uh, I can't remember what he said, but he, like all good comedians, it, Terry Thomas, you know, comedy generally speaking is a triumph of style over content. You can absolutely laugh your head off in front of a great comedian, and two minutes later you can't remember anything he said. <laughs> it's style over, it's, the, it's, it's like the song, it ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it. So that was very funny. But I was in another horror film called The Mutations, and it was an awful uh, pile of wicked shit as well. <laughs> and I didn't really want to do it, but Donald Pleasance was going to be in it, and I thought, wow, well, if Donald sees something in it, you know, there's some yes, merit in this yes, group that I'm missing. So I went along, and it was about a freak circus. <coughs> Couldn't happen here. It was a rather takeoff of a film for those of you. Todd Browning's Todd Browning's 1932, The Freaks. The Freaks, it was called. So we had, and Donald was playing this mad geneticist, you know, and things went wrong. And then I was playing this terrible man in a circus who took away these dreadful, abort, you know, uh, failed genetic experiments. It was really quite a scary idea. Well, it was just uh, uh, terribly funny because an American script, and they're not all that great British director. But anyway, so all these we had all these freaks come in from Alabama because in America, unlike here, they're more sensible. Here, you see, you know, if you uh, can say turn your head around through 360 degrees, you know, which would actually make you a bit commercial, <laughs> certainly in the pub. They said, do that trick again. You say, what's the problem? But in America, if you can do that in America, or in America, if you've got no bones in your legs and you have to walk on your hands or whatever, you can join another group of people and they become a freak circus. The Americans don't find that odd. You wouldn't be allowed to do that here. In other words, we'd make them dependent. In America, they would get together if they were interesting enough, and they would be independent, and they would run 30 shows a day, and they'd all earn a few quid and have chauffeurs or whatever. So all these people come over, very, very strange, obviously. There was a pretzel man who was only about that big. 
commercial name, a pretzel man. He had a friend who used to carry him around on a cushion. Naturally, he was devoted. The fellow carried the cushion. <laughs> <laughs> I begged him not to drink. Uh, <laughs> there was a woman with crocodile uh, skin. Uh, horrific sight. But, I mean, I, I knew lots of girls like that in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> and I know all sorts of people, you know, with the man, like a man with no, no bones in his legs. And, and he walked everywhere on his hands, and that was interesting. But my very favourite was, um, there was also a dwarf in it called Michael Dunn who I think won an Oscar for Ship of Fools with Vivian Lee. And he was just very little, uh, a very uh, abrasive giant uh, dwarf who shouted all the time. And there were all sorts of midgets nipping my dad. So. However, two things happened. Like, first morning I was picked up. We were going to Battersea Park, where there used to be an old, uh, an old kind of open-air theatre. Uh, That's open right, air, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, suddenly this fucking great embassy Mercedes whispers up. And it was about, you know, half past five in the morning. I was living in Holbein Place. And I saw George, the, the driver was getting out, and I said, stay there, it's all right, George. You know, I'll get in. I thought, wow, I've really arrived. So I threw open the door. It was packed with fucking dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> all smoking and reading the sun and talking about crumpet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were very nice, it was very funny. But when we got there, Jack Cardiff, who liked me a lot, by that I mean, he must have known, he used Did to they? listen to me. Uh, when it came to do, you know, shooting on the... All these people who, who did this little act, very pathetic and rather uh, with overtones of the God, rather like Roman Catholics, you know, that the good Lord has blessed me. That kind of resignation, very, very south, southern states. And I said to Jack, you know, these bloody uh, extras we've got in the audience, I said, if we shoot on, if you shoot on them first and then do the reverses on the extras, which is the normal way to do it, I said, you know, they've got no surprise left. And Jack said, Christ. He said, that, you know, that's true, Tom. So he went to talk to the lighting camera. He said, I think Tom was saying, he said, I think we should shoot over the shoulder and then do the reverses, in other words, revert the whole process, on, onto the stars. Yeah. So these people came on, and the woman, you know, with the crocodile skin, ah, oh, and the pretzel, and, you know, all, and so they had a camera, a medium wide shot, and another camera going on close, two cameras set up to save time. The lighting, of course, wouldn't be subtle with two cameras, but... As this was going on, it was there was a real atmosphere as these people came in and did their little act, you know, talking about God. And then came my friend, this wonderful black man, very built like a football player, but with a lovely, sweet, velvet, baritone voice. And he came on and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to praise the Lord for having given me real gifts. And the good Lord, I'm called Popeye, and I'm called Popeye on account of I can pop my eye. And his eye fell out. <laughs> <laughs> right onto his cheek. <laughs> so all the extras were being sick in their hands. <laughs> it was fantastic, you see. And it, and it died down like you've been screaming. It died down a bit. And he said, you know, as if you know, there's no, the Lord is infinite in his mercy. He said, and not only that, does he allow me to pop one eye? Why? The good Lord allows me to pop the other one. <laughs> the second one allowed. Well, I don't know. You've seen a human eye out, and not as many of you have. I have because I worked in hospitals. Like the human eye is very large. I mean, this is about the size of a table tennis ball. So these people were just incredible. So, hey, it was simply wonderful. When we I became very friendly with Popeye. <laughs> and, then, and in uh, Prince of Wales Drive in Battersea, there was a pub there called Queen Victoria or something, King, Queen, King Albert. Uh, so I went, we used to go there, and he used to like bitter beer. Uh, he liked this very good bitter beer they had over there. So I used to go with Popeye. I wanted to be with him. He was so wonderful. And also, I was jealous of him, really. <laughs> uh, but, so we're standing in there, and there was a, in those days, barmaids always had big arms. You know, and were called Lil or something like that. <laughs> they're called Lil or, or Jenny. Jenny, yeah, ask Lil. <laughs> and they're always walking around, uh, uh, they're big on polishing, just to, you know, on opening time like that. And some of them are rather bossy. Anyway, this woman obviously didn't much care for me being with Popeye, who was uh, black and burly. And I was obviously very fond of him, you see. So, um, so we're talking about the I said, listen, when I give you a nudge, Popeye, drop that fucking eye. <laughs> 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 and I said, well, you know, it, it, it's a special kind of gift. And this woman looked round at that, and I said, like an eye fell out. And she fell down and gave me the tail like that, you know, in a praying position like that. <laughs> Christ, Lil, Lil, she cried. And Lil came round and said, what is it, Jenny? She said, does that man know his fucking eyes are so fell out? <laughs> so the woman looked up, and there was Popeye looking absolutely normal, talking. <laughs>
said, here, Lily, you all right? <laughs> so Lily said, yeah, I'm all right. She said, I could have sworn it. I felt like, oh, it's all right, dear. You know, it's okay, fine. So we had a great time. It was a marvelous day. So that was a mutation. So it was a terrible film, but a very nourishing time because of these wonderful people I was with, you know, who, with everything stacked against them, coped, and, and that was marvellous. They were coping with terrible, terrible, what are now called disabilities, weren't they? For them, it was part of their charm. It was their living. You know, if Popeye uh, couldn't have popped his eyes, because he was just an ordinary, simple, uneducated boy from Alabama, what would he have done? He was, he was making, he was trading on his only trick. Gary, yeah. I've got a couple. The first one is, uh, going along the same lines as my friend over there, um, are you prepared to reprise the role as a doctor in the Big Finish CD productions? Well, I am again if they can come up with a nice script, you know. But I, I mean, I think they're very competent. They sent me some to listen to, and uh, they seem to me to be very competent. But really, they seem to reminded me of some of the scripts I used to do in those days. You know, just it just seemed to me, you know, they, they were, the, the stories themselves weren't original enough. When you're in the radio, you know, I think the radio is a, is the most wonderful medium, obviously, mm -hmm. said Tom. And it, they should be able to, you know, do, do all sorts of... Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. telling them somebody yesterday, so many of the talks... I quite like the idea, to very be very brief, you know, suddenly you get a mayday call, and the doctor, you know, in a strange language, it comes through the synthesizer or the voice, whatever we call it, converser, and suddenly we realise we're talking to some whales, and it's a mother whale, you know, in some kind of ocean being hunted by the Japanese, and suddenly we're receiving it, and then we translate it quite lyrically, very strangely, that this whale is sending out a mayday into just into the atmosphere, worrying and wondering about the idea, you know, extending the idea that dolphins can talk or these giant mammals can communicate. Uh, it's a nice romantic view, and may maybe there's some truth in it. And so I hear this terrifying tale of the children, uh, the, the school being slaughtered, and the, the mother not being able to cope with a thing like that. And then, because the doctor is very clever, and can put it back through the voice synthesizer, I talk back to them and tell them what to do. And so what happens is th these whales then lie low or go away, and they have to come out in the smaller boats. And then I'm telling the whales to come up underneath these small boats and how, in other words, to beat off and kill their tormentors. But this will be a, only one narrative. And at the end, so when I'm teaching, I, I get through that one, the very end of the piece would be that there is another Mayday call, and this time it's from the bloody Japanese, <laughs> who were actually, you know, being upended by the whales <laughs> and drowned by them thrashing around and creating these milestones around. And I actually, the BBC wouldn't allow me to do this, I ignore that May Day. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, what would be wonderful is to listen to that May Day and look straight into the camera and say, Sir, the fucker's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the BBC doesn't like popular acclaim like that, do they? They avoid it, you know. They, they would have me, you know, the BBC would say, no, Tom, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. What you'd have to say is, have I the right? <laughs> 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 and the second one? Uh, the second one is, um, I understand you've got your own brain at the moment. I have, yeah. What do you mean at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> do you mean I might change? <laughs> no, no, I'm quite confident in that. Yes, I have my own grave already. Yes, the gravestone is already with my name, big name and uh, date, and well, uh, not only one date, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then my epitaph, yes. I'd love to visit it before you finally... Well, you, it's funny you should say that, isn't it, because sometimes I talk to people about the amazing thing about being a fiction is that sometimes it has the effect on other people of flirting with the fiction. So as if quite ordinary people, I suppose a bit like you, kindly, going along with it this morning, actually enter willingly into in the fictional world in some small way, first by politely listening and and kindly laughing, but sometimes, it, I'll give, give you an example. So I have my grave there, and it says, Tom Baker in big letters, looks very grand, and 1934, <coughs> dash, and then underneath my epitaph, I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, I'm really reassured by that, I like that very much. So, so I think that's very good, because I think, you know, you've got to say something a bit waggish when you go. <laughs> that is quite funny, a doctor saying that. Anyway. So there it is, and I'm mowing the tummies of the dead and all doing all those sort of little tasks and, uh, when I'm out of work to pass the time. Uh, I like uh, being surrounded by the dead because I suppose, really, it, well, to put it frankly, it just makes me feel so superior. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I look out of the window and I bit down, I look at the dead and think it could be worse. You know? <laughs> and when I get near Mr. Cheeseman's grave and it says, not dead, only sleeping, and I rev my Honda mower, I know he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, I think. I could be, but maybe this is all a dream. So. And one day, 
doing the front of the church, and across the um, churchyard where my grave is leaning in a rather obvious place against the porch of a church, I saw a chap standing by my grave. It's funny, you get pro you get proprietorial about your own grave. I thought, well, see, I thought if he pisses against my gravestone, I'd go mad. <laughs> <laughs> no question of that. His head was bent with reverence. And I did another line and came back again, emptied the, <coughs> the basket, loaded up again. I couldn't see him. So I got up on my toes, which made me look very unmysterious, I think, and had a look over the thing. He was kneeling at my graveside. So oh, I came over all queer. And so, anyway, I'm going along the thing, and then suddenly he appears in front of me, looking very odd and distracted, and he said, I said, oh, hi. Uh, just in case, you know, I was going to, be, I was going to give him a pound. I said, <laughs> hi. I said, how are you? He said, fine. He said, fine. I, I've just been paying my respects. So I thought, oh. I said, oh, really? Yeah. He said, I've just been, you know, praying at your grave and putting some flowers on it mark of respect. And I thought to myself, Christ, I'm standing here a fucking mower. <laughs> doesn't he find it odd? He's here. Why doesn't he see me? He was looking at me. We hadn't shaken hands, it's true. And I thought, I thought Christ, he can't mistake me. I, I look very corporeal. Uh, why does he know? He said, he said, I would like to know, can I uh, come back and pay my respects every month? So I said, yes, if you want to. I'm sad about it, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I backed up and went in, took my wife <laughs> and, this, and he went off. Very slowly he went off. And I, then I said to my wife, I'll just go out and check those flowers, because she was joking. She said, I wonder what flowers you put on. The girls are very practical that way. And instantly I said, that's a good thought. I'll go and check the flowers, because if they're fucking chrysanthemums or dahlias, I'll go mad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like chrysanthemums or dahlias on graves. I like them in lines, but not in, So I went over there. This is so sad. Uh, I went over there and then scrawled right across my gravestone in bold, bold chalk. It said, wanker. <laughs> <laughs> and I was deeply wounded and I had to go and, go and get them. He'd it fairly liquid. He'd well, no, I didn't say he'd written it on. Somebody had written it on. I, had, I don't go to visit my grave every day, otherwise people will start talking. But <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I'm standing by my own grave, my head, and I'm putting flowers on it. And I, and I've heard about an identity crisis. <laughs> It's all about a man not knowing whether he's coming or going, it's not whether he's here or there. Uh, so I don't know. But it, I was wounded by that, you know. But then maybe it is because, you know, people enter into this kind of thing. But, but one, I got a, uh, made somebody laugh yesterday in some town or other. This is a very deep story. <coughs> Someone else can ask me a question. On a train going up to, uh, up to London, a man there and a woman there, very interesting looking woman, and me here, a man next to me. And I rather like the look of this woman, you know, the way you have these sudden thoughts, a wonderful secret turmoil of one's imagination, thinking, what a nice looking woman, I really would like to know her. And, uh, and inhaling, you know, someone else's brutal pack of rabat, so a bit heady. <coughs> and um, suddenly, thinking about this woman and looking at her furtively like that, she opened her mouth, I thought she was going to say something, and I noticed that she had the most perfect teeth. And the next thought I had, I'm rushing this story on a bit, I suddenly thought about, this thought came to me, I don't know where from where, if you can explain, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> you didn't guess. This, I thought, do you know, I fancy actually being nibbled by that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the thought made me go pink. You know? <laughs> and I nearly said to the man next to me, have I gone pink? And I would have told him, but I didn't do that. I thought, my God, what did that do? And I really had this feeling, oh, wouldn't it be nice if she was nibbling my ear? <laughs> and I bet she smells absolutely delicious, you see. Anyway, to, we finally get through the journey. <coughs> we get to Charing Cross, the door bursts open, man gets out here, this woman skimmed by me beautifully and said, as she went, she said, not loudly, but I heard it, and so did several other people, she said, I've loved you all my life. <laughs> well, <laughs> I really was, they touched. But I was held up by this gobshite next to me who said, what did she say? <laughs> well, I said, you know, it's flippant. I said, I said well, it's calm. I said, well, she just loved me all her life. He looked at me and said, fuck, she must be fucking mad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it may be, you know, that were, uh, there am I having these great thoughts, and she's having similar thoughts, and she got off with a good one there, you know, just like taxi drivers see me, you know, and say, hello, Mr. Pertwee! <laughs> <laughs> they know. <laughs> they know it's going to give me a, a yeah, like that, uh, to which I have to say, hi, yeah. <laughs> uh, and swallow all that, because, you know, you're part of this kind of cabaret, 
when you, I remember Morgan Fairchild, I was in an awful film once with George Siegel, and Morgan Fairchild was bitterly, she was in love with someone, and, and the press was taking her out. And Morgan Fairchild, who was very nice looking, I think, was in some famous uh, uh, series in America. Flamingo Rose. Where was it? Anyway, she was, she was saying that she had a right to her privacy. And I said, Morgan, certainly within a house you have a right to, but I said, out, you have no rights at all. I pretended I was a great fan, and I want to make this point quite seriously. I said, Morgan, you are being created by me. So when I go around the theatres and come here uh, into this little house, that you know, uh, uh, I've got a full house. I mean, we could get one or two more in, but I mean, we might start fainting. But <laughs> it's a full house, isn't it? And if I'm at Sheffield Playhouse or whatever it's called, lots and lots of Who fans will come out of curiosity. And they, if I, I was doing Othello or Mac, even when I was doing Macbeth, they came. I was at, oh, well, I got lots of laughs at Macbeth. But you're not supposed to have had <laughs> I got lots of laughs anyway. Someone wrote in one of the reviews, they said, I saw Tom Baker last night at Macbeth, and I thought to myself, what a wonderful crumbles he'd make in Nicholas Nickleby. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> when I recorded that recently, one of the young actors said to me afterwards, have you ever played Macbeth? I thought he was taking the piss out of it. <laughs> <laughs> leave it alone. Yeah, just leave it, leave it. Yeah. Any more questions? What should I stop? Can I, um, sorry, I, I haven't got no questions. Um, because, you know, I mean, you're a hero to me when I was growing up as a little boy. And um, I was stopping in there because I was start crying. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, have you any interesting stories like in your time as Doctor Who, anything that sort of really funny happened at a, um, when you was at work one day? Well, yeah, I, I, I'll try and cheer you up if you're on the point of crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might like this one. I was in Australia. At least someone's going to go to Australia. Now. Yeah, I was having a very good time in Australia, and I was going to visit some children's homes and things like this. About 1976, I think. And I arrive at some airport. I think Kalgoorlie, a kind of very minor airport, and I was picked up and driven 50 miles. Um, um, the man said, <coughs> when he picked me up, he said, "A friend of yours is going to meet us at the hotel." I said, "Really? That girl, whatever her name is." Lucy Williams or something like that. I said, I don't know Lucy Williams. He said, oh, she knows a friend of yours in London. So I said, oh, that's right. We can have a drink with her. I'm used to that. And so we drive all these miles. We get to this very nice hotel in Adelaide, I think. And uh, Lucy Williams is waiting for me. You know, and she was really extraordinary looking. She was absolutely gorgeous girl. Amazing. And I, I thought, cool. And so she said, I knew this a friend, she mentioned this friend, I said, oh yeah, I couldn't remember the friend, but I said, yeah, nice girl. And so this fellow then left me and said, I'll come back tomorrow for the first interview. So I had about, you know, it was about seven o'clock at night, I had bundles of, you know, taxpayers' money. I was feeling therefore very confident. And this girl also seemed very interested in me, so I thought, my God, it looks to me as if something might happen here, I might strike lucky. So I bought a girl, we, I bought us a very expensive bottle of champagne, and it seemed even more obvious that we were going to be united, and quite soon. So we had a dinner, you see, and we go upstairs to my enormous, the suite that I had, I think, and we, this girl starts to strip off, and I start to strip off. I, just, I mean, I was nearly going blind for design. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see straight. I mean, even, even not being, even, what Imam was saying, I had so much champagne, I was seeing double. <laughs> <laughs> so I was seeing two of these girls with four of these bosoms, and it was making me very upset. Anyway, as I moved in for what I thought was the kill, this girl said, have you got your costume here? <laughs> so I thought, oh, Christ. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite used to this. Bloody <laughs> hell. I've got it. Fortunately, the place was air conditioned. I thought, I've got to put that bloody hat and scarf on, that big coat that June had probably designed for me, and get aboard. So I said, well, yeah, I do. I said, I have. So I opened my case, and there it was, all beautifully laid out, because I was getting up to this hospital next day. And so I was getting it out, and I went, and she, no, she said, give it to me. <laughs> and she put it on. <laughs> So, so I left aboard her then. <laughs> you know, champagne in my head, absolutely demented with lust, and we were grappling like a pair of demented ferrets. <laughs> it was extremely pleasant, and then suddenly the thought came into my head, Christ, I'm shagging myself. <laughs> uh, 
Do you think we should call it a day? <laughs> That's a good, good point. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank very you good. very much, Tom Baker. You're welcome. <laughs> So was that the, the only Bishop Stringer we had? No, I've got another one in there. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't mind paying because my wife is with me. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's true. Yeah. Well, I really adore Richard. I was saying to my, um, my girlfriend, I said, well, I'm going to see Tom Baker. I'm, I'm shaking off the leaf and I don't know what to get him. Yeah. I said, I want to give him something to say thank you for all the things that yeah. I've watched over I thought, well, I'll get him some jelly babies. I thought, well, what are you doing? I mean, champagne and things. And then there's five fiction SFX. I opened it up and it had your name in it. So I flipped right through page 44. And um, there was a question, what sort of poison do you drink now? And um, I looked on there, Bishop's finger, ah, oh, my dad likes that. Yeah. So I oh, grabbed a couple of these bottles out of the fridge. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. So you're still in there, Dad. No, right. I don't know if you can think of one of those to go home with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. That's really good beer, yeah. Well, when are you <laughs> going to start drinking? Well, well I've already started, but I don't know. Yeah, I think everyone, <laughs> should we all start now and have a, yeah, have a yeah, breather? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.